Thank you very much for coming. Um, today we've got Kevin McMullen from the SLC, who is one of the funding information partner managers. I hope I've got your job title right, Kevin, but I'm sure you'll correct me in a minute. Um, we're going to focus today on some of the SLC changes, um, current changes around policy but and practice as well. So ways of contacting, document upload, etc. And we'll just touch briefly on, on what's coming in the pipeline, um, but I'm not going to steal any of Kevin's thunder. Kevin is based in the Northeast, um, for those of you that don't know Kevin. So there are a number of regional information partner managers um, around the country hence the name. So Kevin will tell you the best way of getting in touch with your own if you don't know that already. Um, so shall I just hand over to you, Kevin? If you could make sure you're on mute, that's great. I think Rosie's put everyone on mute, but I'll mute myself now and then hand over to you. Um, if you put your questions in the chat, sorry, Kevin, put your questions in the chat and then if, um, and we'll do them at the end, um, if that's okay with everyone, because some of them might come up in subsequent slides. Okay, over to you, Kevin. Thank you. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much, Lynn, and thanks to the, the, the team at Black Bullion for inviting us along. Um, I can see quite a few familiar names in the chat, so it's uh, good to be among some friends. And for those of you that haven't met me, uh, yeah, my name's Kevin. I'm from a uh, student loans company. Um, and yeah, uh, as Lynn says, this, um, this session is... Um, Purposely designed, I suppose, with half a little, half an eye on um, some of the changes and enhancements and improvements that have been made um, to our application process, um, but with also half an eye on what to expect next year. We're in that strange little window where 2022-23 has, has, to all intents and purposes, been and gone. Our students are on site, on campus and up and running um, in the hall. Um, but we're not quite there with policy sign off for next year. So it's a good opportunity just to recap um, and uh, cement some best practice messages in uh, for, for what's, um, what changes have happened over the last few few days, weeks and months. Um, so I will share the screen. And as Lynn says, if there's any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. Um, I'm sure there will be time at the end. And I'll do my best to answer them here and now. Um, but if we don't get through them all, um, I'll uh, still take those questions away and we can do some follow up work and make sure that we get the answers to your questions. So hopefully that all sounds um, that all sounds OK. Um, as as I uh, mentioned, we are in that strange time where we're just reviewing 22, 23 um, and some of the things that have gone on. Um, and towards the end, we'll we'll cast half an eye on what's happening next year. So we'll have a look at the policy review. The big priority one policy review was for our Ukrainian nationals. Um, so some some of you may have um, had sort of front desk inquiries uh, in relation to this. Uh, some of you may not have, but uh, there are uh, quite a significant number of uh, Ukrainian nationals that uh, are within the age range of entering higher education. So it's a good opportunity to um, bring you up to speed with where we are with the policy. Um, in terms of the application, uh, some some um, updates really on how best to advise our young people to get as seamless an application submitted as possible. Um, so advice around share codes and digital evidence upload and, and how to apply um, via paper or online. Um, there are a few other uh, categories we wanted to have a look at. Cost of living is the, the catch-all phrase really because these are indeed strange times that we're living in and we want to make sure that we are giving as much help to students as we can, practical help to students as we can with regards to guidance around financial hardship and students that may be experiencing multiple changes of address due to the uh, various cost pressures. But um, yeah, we'll, um, we'll, we'll have a discussion around the, the few issues that come under the umbrella banner of cost of living considerations. A um, little bit of new advice coming out around change of circumstances and the introduction of the new repayment plan five as of next year um, is uh, one of the things that we'll have a look at in, in terms of uh, new and upcoming information, um, which we'll, we'll touch on at the end. So first of all, just uh, for the avoidance of any doubt, if anyone doesn't 
no, it's fairly new to higher education. Uh, Student Loans Company is the organisation uh, that I work for, that we work for. Um, we do work in the various different domiciles around the UK, each with their own unique set of rules and regulations. So for that reason, we we break down the um, the the individual components to Student Finance England, Student Finance Wales, Student Finance Northern Ireland, and uh, we do some work in Scotland as well. So depending on where you are in the country, you will be familiar with that, I'm sure. As Lynn mentioned right at the start, um, we do have a funding information team of which I am one of um, one of eight. Um, and our job really is to be a little bit of a link between Student Loans Company and uh, you guys that are advising um, prospective and current students at university and college. So hopefully you're already in touch with your regional uh, regional advisor um, with regards to the, the IAG support that we can offer. But if not, do reach out and contact them. We have um, monthly updates, monthly bulletins where we can just do a, a soft touch um, update via email just to keep you in a, um, up to speed with what's going on um, but we can also offer some some more sort of in-depth training on on anything related to eligibility uh, entitlement and repayment of student loans so know that we are there um, and say if you haven't um, already met your regional advisor reach out and um, say hello so with regards to the the, the key content of the session I say we want to look at the the policy review for 22-23 and the priority one was uh, an introduction from DFE who give us an instruction to make sure that um, those affected by the conflict in Ukraine were able to access student support uh, so that they could uh, begin or continue their studies. Uh, it's a ever moving picture as you can probably imagine so we are working closely with DFE and um, some of the updates that have been released have been sort of amended as we've gone on um, which does often happen when you um, when you sort of rush through some 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 policy it needs to be refined and reworked as we go so um, hopefully we can bring you up to speed with where we're at um, but essentially what we're um, sharing is good news it's good news for our Ukrainian nationals who if they've been awarded one of the three schemes Ukraine family scheme home for Ukraine sponsorship scheme or the Ukraine extension scheme this will allow them to access uh, student support in order to begin or continue their studies um, there is a link there to some worked examples of some re, uh, of some cases uh, based on nationality and residency so I will make sure that they are shared as well So the key thing around the Ukrainian conflict and the Ukrainian nationals impacted by it is that the, there has been some um, modifications to the long-standing residency requirements that we usually apply um, in student finance. Um, usually we need students to be ordinary resident in England if they're going to uh, pick up uh, Student Finance England funding. We need that to be from the first day of the first academic year of the course. You see from the first bullet point there, there is an exception uh, for our Ukrainian nationals. Ordinary resident in the UK and Ireland since they've been granted the leave, which is um, doesn't tend to cause too many issues. And three years ordinary residence in the UK prior to being awarded support. Again, a relaxation of that for our Ukrainian nationals as of 2022-23. So they will be assessed under the normal regulations without the requirement of having three years UK residency, which brings the Ukraine nationals in line with other protected statuses, uh, like refugee status being the, uh, the main one. There's no requirement to have three years residency. And for academic year 22-23, amendments have been made to the events provision that mean that the Ukraine nationals do not need to be ordinarily resident in the UK on the first day of the course. Okay, so an understandable and common sense approach, I'm sure you'll agree, um, that um, doesn't prohibit UK, uh, Ukrainian nationals from accessing support. Um, and I think that underpins really the, the whole aim of the, of the policy. It's to be as inclusive and as um, overreaching and overarching as possible to allow funding to be put in place for our Ukraine nationals. When it comes to evidence requirements, uh, obviously we do still have a requirement to ask for evidence. Uh, in most cases that will be 
a residency work permit or a permission to travel document, uh, which will um, uh, or confirm the students uh, leave to remain in the UK. It may be that they don't um, don't have one of those permits, but they do have access to uh, permission to travel documentations or passport stamps, which we can confirm by using our links with the Home Office. Um, there is actually um, a share code process that's up and running for Ukrainian nationals. However, we expect that to be used more so in 2023, 24. Um, there isn't any guidance or um, any signposting to the share code process for Ukrainian nationals because the policy was was rushed through. Um, but we are expecting that to increase drastically as of 2023-24. So all of our guidance and all of our online advice will update from 23-24 to include Ukrainian nationals that can submit a share code in lieu of any other evidence requirements. One of those amendments that I mentioned that came in a little bit after the announcement of the policy was um, a change in the events policy. So uh, usually the status that you are at the start of the course tends to stick with you throughout your university career unless an event ha has occurred which um, brings in the um, access to support during your course. So students will be covered by um, an event if they're part of the Ukrainian scheme, they can become eligible for any subsequent years without having been ordinary resident in England on the first day of their course. So this is a rule that's just in place um, for 2022-23. As I mentioned before, this is a, a, a fast moving um, policy that is under constant review and we are expecting further regulatory, regulatory amendments to be made from 23-24 onwards. And it may be that the, the uh, residency requirements are reinstated, but all of that information is, is to be confirmed. But know that um, as a way of making sure that our Ukrainian nationals spend the, have the best opportunity to access support for study, that uh, they can become eligible as an event in academic year 22-23. When that happens, they do become eligible from that point. Um, those of you that have been in HE for a, a while and have de dealt with uh, other rest of the world applicants will see that it, the, the support that that opens up is uh, in line with other protected statuses, i.e. refugees. Um, so depending on the date of the event means they may be able to access tuition fee support for that year if it's granted within three months of the start of the year. But if not, they will be able to access tuition fee support for subsequent course years and maintenance support will be available from the date of the event. So as I say, um, real good positive regulatory introduction to make sure that Ukrainian nationals can access as much support as possible. A few other considerations, again, uh, tweaks really that came in uh, since the start of the year. Um, we do have uh, financial hardship team, which we'll talk about shortly, um, but obviously the evidence requirements for um, students from the Ukraine will be difficult to meet. Um, so we've relaxed the evidence requirements for students going through the financial hardship process, um, which will be reviewed on a case by case basis, and these students can just put in a, a cover and letter, and obviously we'll look at that with, um, you know, through um, uh, sympathetic, uh, sympathetic eyes because evidence is um, difficult, more difficult than most to come by to support financial hardship claims. Students with compelling personal reasons, obviously, again, we look at on a case by case basis, um, but there will be reasons why people have had to leave their course that will be unique to um, our Ukrainian nationals. Um, so there is some guidance there on what would and would not be classed as compelling personal reasons. But again, the overarching guidance there is um, anything out with of your control that impacts your ability to study. So um, I'm sure everyone would agree that this conflict is absolutely out with of their control. So we would look, um, apply common sense and um, look on a case by case basis to see if we can award funding. Those of you that are involved in the business to business relationship around um, submission of um, any COCs, there is specific guidance for our Ukraine nationals on the HEP website, um, just giving advice on what is required in the information box um, that will 
um, mean that we can do some manual intervention and one of our assessors will have a look at that on a case by case basis. And finally, when it comes to assessments, uh, norm normally for funding purposes, we, we, we talk about separation um, in so much the parents are no longer in a relationship and we would ask for evidence of that separation. Um, of, obviously, again, common sense prevails and DfE are aware that there will be circumstances where parents are separated but still in a relationship. For example, one parent may be um, involved in the conflict. So we take a, a common sense approach to that as well. And we would just assess um, without the need for evidence of that parent. So a few other things that come out of the, the fallout of the um, Ukrainian conflict. But as I say, if you are dealing with any cases that are a little bit complex, we're, we're all learning this as we go, I think, to a, to a certain extent. So if you do get cases that present on the front desk at your um, at your institution, then do reach out and we'll be happy to work with you and make sure we get the best outcome for these students. With regards to uh, more general information about the application and um, the information that we want to share in order to make sure that students have as smooth an application journey as possible, uh, we'll have a look at some best practice advice with regards to enhancements that have been made on the application process. First and foremost, we are working on the um, on the proviso that the best contact is no contact. So we, we, if we can put out as much information to help students and sponsors self-serve, then there is less of a requirement for uh, students and, con and sponsors to contact in and um, contact the contact centre. With that in mind, we have created a series of guides across gov.uk, uh, which are answers to the most common questions uh, that we um, are experiencing. So hopefully trying to divert the need to call in by answering the FAQs on gov.uk. But also, and I think probably most useful is a series of how-to videos on our YouTube channel. You can see from the screenshot there that they are all sort of two minutes long. So they are, um, they're, they're very manageable, they're nothing too in-depth, but they provide a step-by-step -step approach to do some of the more basic things that are required um, as part of a seamless application. We know that working with uh, practitioners, there is often a call for uh, the ability to see what the students see. Um, our new online application system is, is dynamic, so it's pretty difficult to get screenshots and things like that because the answer to one question will determine what question is asked next. Um, but these how-to videos are uh, the next best, next best thing. So do know that they are there. If you want to uh, embed them or link to them from your website to ours, anything that um, promotes their usage and promotes the best practice um, to, our, to our young people and their, and their sponsors, that can only be a good thing. So know that they are there and available to use. And we do have our digital evidence upload. Um, so we do see um, some confusion between students and parents around what can be updated and what uh, can it be uh, uploaded. Uh, so there is new guidance on the gov.uk website and a specific video on how to upload the evidence uh, that is all linked up. When you get the slides, you'll be able to uh, click on the link and it will take you straight to that video. So again, trying to do what we can to help promote self-service um, with that overarching theme that the, the best contact is no contact. And if we can empower students and their parents and partners to um, monitor their own account and run their own account, then that will, um, that will benefit across the board. Probably worth mentioning uh, uh, an enhancement that came in where UK customers applying for SFE undergrad products will no long, longer be required to submit an original copy of their birth certificate to SFE. So uh, again, those of you that will have, may have been in higher education for a number of years will know that the best way to prove your ID is usually a passport number. If the passport is not valid or students might not have a passport, we've um, traditionally always asked for a physical copy of their birth certificate that needs to be posted in. Um, but uh, we've finally caught up and there is no need to post the copy of the birth certificate. Students on SFE undergraduate can now digitally upload their birth certificate 
uh, in the usual way. So the the reason and the rationale behind that is a, a non, part of an ongoing review really to make sure that the applications are as seamless as possible. We're trying to move away all from um, the evidence burden being sent through the post because obviously the turnaround time will be a lot quicker. So our guidance has been updated again on gov.uk but the key takeaway message SFE undergraduate students if they don't have a passport number to provide as part of their main application process they can digitally upload their birth certificate to SFE. So again steps in the right direction um, and a smoother transition into university. Uh, another change that came in this year, you may or may not already be aware of this, but just in case you do get um, frontline queries um, from students whose perhaps their parents have divorced or separated, there are new documents uh, in circulation. Um, a conditional order will now replace the decree nicely and a final order will replace the decree absolute. So uh, the message for our students is if they need to prove separation themselves or if they need that their sponsors need to prove um, separation, there will be different ways of doing it as of April 2022. So know that we will accept either the, the old um, documents, the, the two decree absolutes and the decree and IC applications will Will still be in circulation so we can um we can accept them but uh, they will inevitably become obsolete as these conditional and final orders become um become more commonplace so something there probably for the medium to longer term to, to keep an eye on for our eu nationals we do um take eu share codes which is the best way to confirm your identity and residency. Um, so EU share codes went through a bit of a journey themselves when they were first introduced a couple of years ago. Uh, we're still running a, a manual process for share code confirmation. We don't have that fully automated link with the Home Office as yet. Um, so we will be asking um, students to manually provide their EU share code. When they submit their online application, we'll contact them and ask for proof of their share code and when the status was awarded. A uh, change from the Home Office side of things is the share codes are now valid for 90 days. Uh, you may remember they were originally valid for 30 days, which put a little bit of a tight turnaround on uh, when we were able to use a valid share code in terms of processing their application. But um, hopefully the increase to validity for 90 days, now that we're over that initial period of transition, will mean that um, there is less need to generate multiple uh, share codes. We do aim to validate the share codes within 10 days of receipt, and that, that hasn't changed. But as I say, that 90 days validity gives us a little bit more breathing room. If students are directed to complete a paper application as opposed to an online application, they can input their details directly onto the form itself. Um, but um, if it's an online application, then we'll, we'll go out separately and ask for that share code to be submitted. Um, probably worth just jumping to the bottom bullet point on this screen where a valid share code is required in place of a passport being sent in as proof of identity. This is something that we learned, as I said, during transition where we were getting um, share codes submitted, but we're also getting lots of passports through the post as well uh, from our EU nationals. So our messaging was probably um, not as strong as it could have been. Um, so uh, in an attempt to um, get the message out there, uh, if you are in a position where you're working with EU nationals, all we need is the share code because that share code um, is evidence that they've shared the identities with the Home Office. So all we need is a share code, again, relieving that burden of additional evidence from our EU students, which is a good thing. Uh, again, something that we learned as we went along while we were processing the applications um, was that share codes are generated for a multitude of different things from claiming benefits to working in the UK. Um, we need students to generate a share code as the screenshot in the bottom right hand corner says um, for another reason. 
um, which is one of those foibles of the uh, the government system. Um, but um, share codes are fairly quick to generate. We just make sure that when the students are generating their share codes, they click that they need it for uh, another reason and not one of the, the things like being able to work in the UK. I touched on right at the start that share code um, guidance and applications will be fully updated for academic 20 academic year 23-24 to include um, share codes from our Ukraine nationals. We may still see some this year um, if Ukrainian nationals have been in a position to access the government app and generate their share codes. So they, they, they will be accepted this year, but because the guidance isn't there and the guidance doesn't uh, direct Ukraine nationals on gov.uk, um, then the likelihood is that the share codes um, will not come into common practice, common usage until next academic year. And all of our forms and guidance will be updated accordingly. So um, the share codes is great um, because it relieves that burden of sending evidence through the post. Um, and again, good news story that it can be broadened out to our UK, re Ukraine nationals as of next year. And Finally, one of the things really that it, it's probably worth mentioning is that we're not in a position where we have a universal online end-to-end -end system. Uh, we're not quite where we want to be with that. Um, so um, this slide is designed to help guide um, students to the right place to apply. So we do have a full end-to-end -end online process for our UK nationals and our EU nationals with settled status who will be applying for full support. Similarly, with our Irish nationals, the questions in the residency section of the um, application form will ask our Irish nationals where they've been resident. So if they've been ordinarily resident in uh, the UK for three years, they would be getting full support, in which case full support means you can go right the way through on the online application system. Similarly, DSA and CCG, if it's applied for at the same time as the undergraduate core support, then any disability support and childcare support can be put in place at the same time. Where you will be redirected to a paper form is if you are an EU national who is um, entitled to fee support only, so pre-settled students or students that might just want the tuition fee. Our migrant workers, there is an evidence burden on our migrant workers, which means that um, they'll be redirected to go down the paper route and send in the additional form. And our Irish nationals that perhaps do not have three years ordinary resident in the UK, if they have residency that is a mixture between the UK and Ireland, that would entitle them to fee support. And in which case the questions in that section of the form will redirect them to complete a paper form. And with regards to disabled student allowance and childcare uh, that is applied for separately to core support, so separately to your tuition fee and maintenance loans, you'd need to complete the paper forms downloaded from gov.uk. Um, again, there is guidance and a short film to explain the evidence requirements and how to um, submit the right evidence or to complete the right form, which is all linked up to uh, the, the slide once you get the presentation after the session. But hopefully that just gives you an idea of um, who can do end-to-end -end on a computer or a laptop and who will be redirected to submit a paper form. Okay, so that's where we are in terms of our uh, applications. Um, so there's a few sort of separate things that we've we've grouped together under the, the banner of uh, cost of living considerations because it's affecting everybody and of course um, our student population as well so we need to make sure that we are mindful of that and that we are um, conscious of the difficulties that uh, students may find themselves in so uh, a little bit of a uh, best practice advice here i suppose um, a gov.uk page has been updated to help students understand the living costs that they may, they may need to factor in to um, their university or college careers. Um, so I suppose that has been created with half an eye on next year's cohort uh, so that they can do as much budget work and research work on, on, on how much things cost and um, you know what is the, the what is it really like financially to be like a student um, to be a student in 2023. want to make sure we're using um, 
as much resource as we can for these students. So we, we try and do a little bit more than we have previously, perhaps on understanding the student living costs, but also what to do if you're in financial hardship. Um, you know, there, there are um, avenues to explore and there are there is help out there. We wanna make sure that we are doing everything we can to signpost and support these students that may find themselves in financial difficulties. So um, some sort of overarching advice and guidance there. Again, feel free to link from your website to that um, because I'm sure that is a consideration locally as well as um, nationally for, for gov.uk. Um, we do have a piece of ongoing work with our financial hardship team. Um, we have got some updated guidance that isn't quite ready to share just yet. I was hoping it might be by today, but it wasn't. didn't quite get over the line. Uh, but we are making some changes to the financial hardship process. Ultimately, we've redesigned the form and we've made it easy, easier for students to apply for financial hardship and supply the evidence. The main benefit is that these forms and evidence can be uploaded digitally. There is obviously a, a real um, need to get these applications processed as quickly as possible. These are students that are in uh, financial difficulties and time bound financial difficulties. So we obviously want to make sure that we are doing everything we can to get these applications for financial hardship turned around with as quick, um, quickly as possible. Just for the avoidance of doubt, hardship applications can be considered for students who uh, perhaps have had a previous overpayment and their entitlement has been reduced. That includes uh, returning students, so perhaps they might have been out the system for a while uh, and are returning to study. I'm, I'm thinking off the top of my head about things like um, uh, you know, career changes that might be going back into to study in their sort of late 20s, early 30s maybe. Uh, there may be an overpayment that will reduce their future entitlement, um, but it could be current students as well. Any students that uh, were suspended and want funding to be extended through suspension, there are certain criteria that can be met where um, stopping the funding that is um, made available to uh, students on suspension would leave them in financial difficulty so we may be able to continue their student support through suspension. A scheduled payment brought forward again um, if the payment dates are a little bit down the line but there is criteria that is met where um, a payment could be brought forward to alleviate financial hardship then that is something that, that is within the gift of the financial hardship team. Uh, or students that have withdrawn from study and have previously been awarded grants. Again, there are circumstances where we can award grant support until the end of the term in which the student withdrew, just to help mitigate those financial pressures um, that the students may find themselves in. Um, so the financial hardship form has been updated. Um, I know there is um, some discussion and ongoing around the, 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 the guidance on how best to complete the form and how best to get it to the student as quickly as possible. Um, sorry, that's not available just yet, but the, there, is, there will be a guidance chapter that's updated on the practitioner's website. But essentially what we want is the student to contact us or you to contact us on behalf of the student. We'll send them a financial hardship form once we've checked that they meet all of the criteria um, and then they can complete and digitally upload that form for a quick turnaround. So obviously we want to keep the uh, financial hardship team workflow as, um, as clear as possible. And we know that sometimes uh, we can get, um, students can get con confused and they can put financial hardship forms in when what they meant to be putting in was uh, perhaps compelling personal reason, evidence, that type of thing. So in the interest of keeping the application path as, um, as clear as possible so we can turn these applications for uh, financial hardship support around as quickly as possible, um, we, we'll send the student the form and um, they can get it back to us as quickly as possible. So do look up, do look out for updated uh, guidance on this. I say it's due any, any day now. The link that is uh, highlighted there in purple will be, um, the, the same link will be valid, uh, but the wording will look a little bit different um, once it's been updated. 
some of the key messages around financial hardship. Um, we want students to complete the form, uh, gather their evidence together. Um, the form will give guidance to what is available and they can digitally upload the form with any um, additional evidence as soon as possible. Postgraduate students, just as a, a little bit of an, an aside, will still need to go through um, the postal route. It's only the undergraduate students where we can accept uh, digital upload for financial hardship applications. Um, that may be of interest to some more than most, but worth just uh, mentioning the, the differentiation between undergrad and postgrad. Undergrad, we're looking at digital uploads, postgrad through the post. Um, now, one of the uh, consequences that we may see as a result of um, uh, cost of living is multiple changes in address. Okay, so some of the advice and suggestions that um, we have is remember that all of the uh, letters that are sent to students will be uh, saved on their online account. Um, there may be instances where if there's changes between parental home and an elsewhere, uh, residence or an elsewhere to the parental home where a reassessment is required and um, some of you will know we do a we do a sampling exercise every every well we have done for the last few years so I think it's um, fairly safe to say that that will become common practice that the the um, the elsewhere rate of loan those that put the elsewhere on the application um, haven't changed their mind and decided to move home because that would be in a reassessment but for those students that are um, moving around um, from house to house, but, but leaving their parents to one side, um, they can keep up to date with their um, correspondence online. Um, just be aware that some correspondence is system generated, so it might still go out to a, a postal address. Um, there is advice to say that in exceptional circumstances, which includes homelessness, a student may want to use a third party address on their account with the third party's permission. Uh, obviously we need this to be, be um, noted on the student's account, but um, some, of the, some of the stories that are around, I'm sure you will, um, you'll have seen these and you'll, you'll know about the, the, the difficulties at your own institutions around things like um, affordable living and, and student housing and things like that. So you, you'll probably know better than I do, but um, we just wanted to address that and say, um, remember if there are students that are moving around multiple times, if there needs to be a, a change to their um, assessment in terms of parent or elsewhere, you know, we, we, we uh, urge students to make sure that that happens, um, but the students can make changes to their contact details on their own online account during the academic year. And under certain circumstances, exceptional circumstances, um, utilize that third party but they shouldn't miss out on anything because the correspondence will be available digitally as well so um, not a directive really but it's just more of a um, uh, sort of suggestions on ways to help the students in those situations uh, I did say I'll touch on um, change of circumstances I'm not going to I'm literally going to just touch on it uh, we do have a campaign underway for students that are doing a, an early change of course circumstance. Um, advice to, to talk to yourselves at the institution and make sure they are making informed decisions. That campaign is up and running. Um, and uh, I mentioned previously, there is a link to uh, the HEP services website for those COCs involving Ukrainian nationals. So I think you've got a session dedicated to change of circumstances later today, so I won't dwell too much on it. We'll jump straight ahead to everyone's favorite topic, repayment and the introduction of uh, plan five. So uh, plan one uh, loan, if you, you, well, you must've been in higher education if you remember for a long time, if you remember a pl plan one loan. Um, plan two loan is from our, the majority of our learners from 2012. Plan three is for our postgrad students, plan four for our Scottish students. And now as of next year, plan five. Again, with half an eye on um, cost of living, I think it might be more common than usual for um, students and their sponsors to take an interest uh, in how much loan repayment they are being asked to make. Uh, the new threshold, I'm sure you've probably already seen, £25,000 per year up until April 2027. 
So we do create these um, exa examples and um, uh, tables that aim to put a little bit of context on how much that would cost um, in real terms. Uh, there is advice and um, available from the government and the DFE Education Hub around the rationale behind the change and what it costs in real terms. Um, but the two big changes, obviously, the threshold changing to £25,000 and the write-off period extended from 30 to 40 years for students starting next year. So if you do need a little bit of um, understanding behind what drove that decision, uh, the rationale from the government is available for you to read and share. As if probably more parents might have more of a, uh, an eye on this than perhaps in previous years. Um, there is a uh, various comparison tables that are, uh, that are out. And when we move into the new year, as I say, we will make those um, those tables available for you to help put a little bit of context to how much that will cost you on a month-to-month -month basis based on your salary. Uh, the other thing that is worth mentioning that uh, has changed is the, the maximum interest that has applied uh, for a student loan. And the, some people may be very interested in this, some less so, um, but the, um, the RPI figure with the, the way of the world that we're living in uh, did go up during the year and there was some media concern around the fact that student loans could um, feel the pinch on that with interest hitting sort of 12 13 percent but the interest has been capped um, there are sort of changes to the uh, the amount of interest that is attached to a student loan um, various rates between uh, November and March and then it's going to get reviewed again at the start of the next financial year but um, know that the the government does have it within its gift to interject and if the the rpi figure uh, becomes more than the prevailing market rate then it can interject and cap the interest on a student loan which it has done this year so again just things that may be more common than usual um, in the conversations that you're having with students and parents a little bit further ahead uh student support Financial memorandum is expected any time now, really. Um, they tends to land um, in November. And whilst those figures need to be ratified, um, they do give an indication of the government direction of travel for what funding will be allowed in 23-24. So the maximum maintenance loan rates is uh, obviously critical to a lot of people's uh, budgeting and research and decision-making process. Um, generally speaking, I think it's safe to say that what you get in the financial memorandum is what is confirmed um, but um, you know we do need to wait for that period of parliamentary scrutiny before they get signed off but um, those that, that financial memorandum will be uploaded onto the practitioner website and usually appears around about now so do keep an eye out for that we'll make sure we mention that uh, when it does become available as part of our um, monthly bulletin that we mentioned right at the start of the session some other things on the horizon, uh, we are uh, in the midst of a short course trial. Um, this is a bit of a precursor to uh, lifelong, uh, lifelong entitlement, lifelong loan entitlement. Uh, 22 agreed providers are running courses of 30 or 40 credits um, that are last no longer than 12 months. Um, this is uh, essentially um, a little bit of a, a trial that the government is running to see what the appetite is like for short modular modular learning. Um, so we are just in the middle of that, but um, you may be one of those 22 approved providers. Um, but we are running that pilot project alongside our usual work. Uh, and again, it might be that you are um, asked about what these short courses entail so we can provide information around the HE short courses trial which goes on till 2025 so I wouldn't expect anything particularly imminently because obviously we need the trial to run before the government can make its decision about the um, the appetite for modular short learning um, and next year as well higher technical higher technical qualifications designation for HE student finance will extend to level four and five courses that were previously funded through the advanced learner loan route. Um, so level four and level five certificates and diplomas. So a lot of work going on behind the scenes with our uh, course database team and our uh, regulatory team to make sure that um, 
the the umbrella HA funding banner um, is the, the funding matches the cost levels. So uh, expect more news as we go through and get into the new year on on all of those things. Uh, thought it was worth mentioning those things that we're working on in the background that probably don't get the airtime that uh, that they deserve. But if you do want to know more about um, those those trials or the changes for next year, uh, do reach out to your your regional advisor and we can go into more detail if needed.